All right, so we are still in Luke chapter 19. We have been in this parable for three weeks now. The first week, we were focusing on what manner of persons we ought to be. Uh, the second week, we were focused on Jesus' commission as the nobleman to be busy and occupied, not lazy and preoccupied. And last week, we focused on the well done, living for the well done. Uh, one thing that is that I, I've pressed in here, and I don't think it's being pressed enough in the body of Christ at large, and maybe even not even enough in here, but this entire par parable is predicated on the fact of Jesus being Lord, Jesus being Master, and the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is just that as well. It's an invitation to bow the knee, to enter into another kingdom, and, and as such, there is obviously, if you're going to have a kingdom, you have to have a king, you have to have subjects. That is paramount. And of course, it's, it's, uh, it goes out from there uh, in terms of implications as to how we live and how we conduct ourselves and how we think, you know. And, and of course, it's a great analogy that most people can tie into on one level or another, regardless of what side of the divide you are on. And that uh, is uh, our nation right now, uh, America. And I'm not going to start talking politics because I'm really not interested. But at the end of the day, a nation is set up by principles. It's got uh, things that they adhere to. And um, if you align yourself with that nation, then you are proclaiming, Not you may not be doing it, but you're proclaiming by going through the naturalization process to become a citizen that you are essentially bowing the knee to their way of life. I now identify myself as, you know, a Ugandan or an American or, uh, you know, someone from Zimbabwe. Well, I don't know how they, they divide things up in other nations, but you know what I mean. They, they, you, you know, you, sell, you identify yourself and align yourself with that country and with that mindset and with a set of principles, the guiding principles that uh, is the basis of, of your laws. And you condition your life based upon those things and, and adhere to them. Uh, and some of them you might not always agree with. Some of them you might think are silly, but you still obey them, uh, by and large. It doesn't mean you don't ever break one, but, uh, uh, you know, it's it, the general principle of your life is you're dedicated to maintaining these ideals. This is exactly what it is to be in the kingdom of God. And, of course, we have, we've, it's not any wonder at all that our, our, our current nation has turned into the, the mess that it has because, you know, like I said, the work that God is doing in the world right now is the church. Church, this, the, the body of Christ is the center focus of the entire universe right now, period. Now, when we're gone, then God will begin to deal with uh, uh, the world and with Israel particularly. But right now, center stage is the body of Christ. Center stage is God's children. And, and I'm telling you, like we've said many times, God said, I will spend nations for you. God is, God is going to do whatever is necessary to reconcile the heart of his bride and have her ready. Amen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and a lot of times, a lot of times, not because of his will, but because of ours, that requires different forms of bondage. Uh, it requires different types of captivities uh, because of the fact that we won't allow our heart to be and stay captive to our Lord we allow our hearts to get romanced off into other areas. And so the Lord's like, okay, well, I'll fill you with your own devices. Um, just like, you know, as we read in this parable here, this seems to be a default pattern with God. He just, if that's what you want, okay, I'll just give you a bunch of it and see how you like it, right? You know, uh, you like the Babylonians? Great. Be a Babylonian. Now you are in captivity to Babylonia and you've got to serve their gods and do their things and do their work and, and serve their king and let me know how well that wears for you. You know, and, and they hated it, and they cried out for deliverance. And, and God brings them out by a mighty hand. Next thing you know, they're like, ah, well, you know, we like those Assyrians. We like what they do, and that's great. And, you know, you know, we, we like their gods, and we sure wish we were like them. God's like, you like the Assyrians, do you? Okay, well, here, be an Assyrian. And, you know, and so they're underneath them, and they're under captivity to them, and doesn't wear well. And they cry out, oh, God, we liked it better back when we were with you. And this is back and forth all the time with God's people. And in the same parable, you see um, the, the last servant, who, which is the one we're going to deal with today. Um, that last servant, uh, 
uh, did not do anything that the Lord, uh, his, his noble men, his, his master had told him to do. And he came to, uh, so when his turn came to give an account, he said, you know what, I, I, I knew, I knew you were a hard person and that you, you gathered where you didn't sow and you, you and all this stuff. And he said, you know, um, uh, and he said, I'm going to judge you based on the way you saw me. Not the way I really am, but the way you saw me. You knew I was a hard man. Why didn't you act like I'm the kind of guy that you need to be working for, not being lazy underneath? <coughs> if you knew I was a hard man. I mean, Jesus isn't a hard man, right? But if you knew I was a hard man and I gathered where I had not sown and all that, then, you know, why didn't you act differently? See what he, but notice what he do. He, he, what he did. He judged them based on his own words, right? And that's what he does repetitively. Oh, we like the Babylonians. Okay, great. There, be a Babylonian, right? We want a king. No, you don't. Yes, we do. Okay, here, have a king. God does this all the time, right? And so, you know, for you and I, now that we, when we've come into the body of Christ, the body of Christ is large in the last century in particular, and really in the last 50 to 60 years, has made a huge departure from the way that the New Testament church was supposed to live. And we are preaching, what we're doing is we're teaching the world how they ought to be living, and they're doing it. The, literally, the, the nation is divided, and the reason why is because they believe it's okay to be an American and to reap all the benefits of being an American without being dedicated to the principles of being an American. Sounds like the gospel I hear. You can be part of the body of Christ, and you can be set apart to go to heaven, but you don't have to live that lordship stuff. He doesn't have to be lord. You can do what you want and live by your own rules, and you know you don't have to bow the knee to anybody. I mean, just come across the border and do what you want. Hello? Yes. That's what's happening. It's exactly what's happening. That's exactly what's happening in the body of Christ. So is it any wonder that we see it mirrored in front of us in the world? And, we, and the silly thing, the sick thing, is that you could a lot easier to get a Christian upset about what's happening in our nation than what's happening in the body of Christ. Or in our own hearts. It's a lot easier to get upset about that. People just get all upset, and they're going to petition this, and they're going to they're gonna do that and do this, and blah, 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 and they talk about it all the time. Uh, Christians in the, the modern age, you will find them a thousand times easier to quickly talk about politics than about their Lord. And God's like, you know what? You know, it, it would be easy to shift to talking about me because it, it, the dynamic looks the same, at least in our nation it does. Right? It looks exactly the same. Just let people in and, and reap the benefits without any commitment whatsoever. That is the gospel that's being taught. That is not the gospel that is represented in the scriptures. And so when we talk about the lordship of Jesus Christ, now you do need to understand, and I've addressed this in the past, and I'm taking a moment to do it now again today, there is a doctrine out there called lordship salvation. and there are, oh, There's people out there that have accused me of being lordship salvation teacher, and I'm not. I am, but I'm not. I am by name, but not by theology. The, just like uh, with any other belief system. You've got the Baptist, but then you've got like 15,000 different variations of Baptist. Same thing with Lordship Salvation. But the extreme of Lordship Salvation theology is a person loses their salvation all the time and has to get born again again. Because every time that Jesus isn't Lord in your life, you have fallen. And if you die right then, you're going to hell. And you better repent and come to Jesus again, and you're good until the next time you sin. That's what... That is a theology out there. Now, you look at me funny, but you know what? Some of the things you think sometimes are stupid. So, you know, um, so it's okay. Uh, what I'm trying to say, though, is that, you know, lordship salvation, that is an expression of it. And, of course, we don't believe that, right? I mean, the scripture is very, very clear that Jesus will not. You can't get born again and again, right? That's not going to happen, right? You could apostate yourself, but that's a one-way trip. There's no coming back from that. And it's not something you just trip and fall into just because you sinned once. Isn't that true? Yes. We see examples in the New Testament of people who had committed sin as lived in sin in the New Testament. And nowhere did Paul or James or John tell them, you need to repent and get born again, again. Never, never once. Never once. They just told them, you know what? You need to repent and you need to change the way you're living and rededicate yourself to Christ. But this has got nothing to do with getting born again. Again, they're still his child, right? So, you know... 
But when I'm talking about lordship, I'm talking about that when we've come to Jesus Christ, we have literally, we live aware that we bowed the knee to enter into this kingdom. You cannot be part of this kingdom without a bowed knee. You cannot. It is a lie to tell someone you can be part of the kingdom of God and yet live as though God is not your king. That is a lie. It's a lie. You're like, well, then that, I know a number of people that probably excludes. Well, it might. It just might exclude them. They may not have never been in to exclude in the first place. I don't know. All I do know is that you cannot claim that Jesus is Lord if he's not Lord. Am I making sense? I mean, I, I mean, common sense tells you, and Jesus is the one that decided what that meant. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do nothing that I told you to do? Clearly, Lord means you obey. So if you're not living a life of habitual obedience, that does not mean flawless obedience. It means it's the pattern of your life. You defer to this. It's your heart's desire. When you do something wrong and you, you lie or you cheat or you do something wrong against your king, your heart is brought to the end of itself and you bring yourself before the king and admit what you've done and you receive reconciliation with your king, right? Because you were not walk, his two can't walk together unless you agree. And you were not agreeing with him when you did that. You worked against his kingdom. Do you not think that that at least requires the the um, the um, the uh, uh, the decency of going to him and and and, all, and owning up to it and say, you know what, uh, I I committed treason. I, I worked against your kingdom. It, it's not my heart. I allow myself to get captivated by something else. And I, and I temporarily, at least in my heart, um, bowed my knee to another king. And I am so, so sorry. And you will get nothing but forgiveness from him in that. Amen? Complete restoration. Right? But, you know, it, even that doctrine has gone to the wayside in, 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 in the modern church. I am amazed how many people I run across, even people who have been um, uh, in mainstream fundamental churches who have come to the point where they don't believe that confession of sin is necessary. You know, Jesus paid for it all. You don't have to ask forgiveness every dumb time. It's already been forgiven. I'm like, well, that's not what my Bible told me. You know, and you know, and you know, you you can you can dance around the subjects all you like, but and they do this by by mincing with words and 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 going back to the Greek and connecting it to this and connecting it to that. But at the end of the day, it still said what it says. He's talking to Christians in First John one nine. He's not talking to the world. He, it, it, that's abundantly clear you literally have got to do ridiculous fantastic gymnastics to turn first john 1 9 to talking about the world they say it's talking about gnostics or docetics people who aren't born again i'm like no that's not the passage that's not what it's talking about you know i i mean the truth of the matter is if that is what they were talking about number one first john 1 9 was poorly written because it's not talking about sins uh, about, uh, it, it's, I mean, it's talking, um, it says, if anyone, um, how, how does it word it again? I'm sorry. Um, if we confess our sins, plural, then he is faithful just to forgive us our sins, plural, right? And it means individual acts, right? Uh, but the other one that it talks about early in the chapter, it talks about sin in the singular, which is a totally different issue, right? So, you know, the, a, a child of the devil does not have to confess their sins, plural, to come to Jesus, they confess the sin of not submitting to Christ. That is their sin. Hello? There's only one sin that God is dealing with. See, this is, the, this is how the devil probably came up with that theology and so to the church because of the fact that the only group of people that that statement is true about, that the sins have already been forgiven, are for the world. Their sins have already been forgiven. The only sin that is keeping them from relationship with God is not the fact that they went out and had illicit sex or that they stole on their taxes or they, they beat their dog. None of that is sending them to hell. The only, thing, the only sin, singular, that's being dealt with is the fact that they never have confessed the lordship in literal submission to him, the lordship of Jesus Christ, and entered into relationship with God through that. That is their sin, no, not sins, plural, right? But when you're talking to the church, he's talking about those who commit sins, plural, yes. right? Hello? Yes. So you know, individual acts 
And so, you know, this is an important thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's no different than it is in a relationship. When you have a son or a daughter or a nephew or a niece or, or even a friend, you cannot have that person walk contrary to you, deliberately do something that defies your character and does it in relation to the relationship with you and still continue to have a close friendship until something has been said, something has been done about that breach. Isn't it right? Yes. If you just sweep it under the rug, you already know what that's like. I mean, I, maybe you don't. Maybe you've been more diligent than that. But if you've ever been in a situation, especially with a child, a kid, that just, just wouldn't, would not apologize for anything. Their parents didn't make them apologize. And, and you continue to try to have a relationship with that kid, you notice it never really gets back off the ground again. It can't. Because there's always that lump in the carpet that gets swept underneath the carpet that it was never dealt with. Are you following me? Yes. They never owned up to what they did. They still want to act as though everything's okay when the last thing they did to you was essentially spit in your face. And they never dealt with it. They did not have, the, they did not have enough respect for you to own it. And that's all God's asking for. This isn't about God holding a grudge against us. It's about he can't walk together with someone who, because you can by not coming to him and admitting it and owning it and seeking reconciliation, you are still sinning. You're still walking in sin by not doing that. Are you following? No wonder the enemy has been diligent to sell that doctrine to the body of Christ. You know how many people are out there walking around unreconciled to their Lord because they've been told they don't have to? It's, very, it's sick. Yes, it is. It's scary. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is everything. So this passage, when we're dealing with this chapter, I mean, like I said, all the parables of Jesus seem to be talking about the kingdom of God, and almost every single one of them, in one way or another, talk about stewardship inside that kingdom, right? So that is paramount. So now, again, uh, our, take, our takeaways are the same. They haven't changed. Examine yourself. Now, I, I, let me ask you, how? How do you examine yourself? This is the first thing I want you to get out of these lessons is examine yourself. How do you do that? You see if you line up with what? Okay, yeah. You use the, you use the word of God definitely as your plumb line. So you, you compare how you've been acting with what the scriptures have to say. Okay. That, that's definitely true. What else? You invite the Holy Spirit into it. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the reference I gave you a few weeks ago was Psalm 139. I didn't actually give you the reference, but I quoted one, uh, Psalm 139, verse 20, 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's anything twisted in me. Right? Something that I've taken that was a straight path, and I twisted it to my own liking. Right? And then lead me in the way of everlasting. But what, what is that? It's a request. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to take hold together with me and search this heart of mine because I don't know myself. Right? Yes. I, can, I can think I'm doing everything the way I need to do it, and uh, I know that there are hidden areas that my own mind does not know what's going on, and I'm asking you, I'm inviting you, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honestly begging you, come in and search my heart and reveal anything in it that's twisted. Anything that is running contrary to your lordship. And this is not, that you know, and there's different ways that, you know, you could get a dozen people ask, saying that same prayer and have a different motive in each heart. Right? But what God is looking for is a heart of diligence, a heart of allegiance to him. Where you're coming to him saying, you know what, I don't want anything in me that's treasonous. <laughs> I mean, I know it's not treason in a literal sense because in order for it to be treason in a literal sense, I wouldn't be asking you to tell me what it is because I'd know what it is. But I don't want anything in me that you even find the slightest bit offensive. I want to be a home for you. I don't just want to be your house. I want to be your home. I want you to be at home in my heart. I want your lordship to be comfortable with me. Amen. I want to work with you, not against you. I want to establish the rule and reign of Christ in my life. <laughs> Jesus Christ has earned my allegiance in every, in every way. And I want my life to show gratitude by not resisting you in anything. So please, please come in and point out anything that's not right. Amen. You, have the, you see the heart that I'm talking about. This is not... The, the, the white knuckled, I'm scared, I don't want to be rejected, I don't want to be, um, you know, whatever. This is not a fear of judgment asking God to come in. It's a throwing open the door. It's, a, it's an open house. You're asking, this is a house inspection. It's like, you know, before you buy a house, 
uh, you, you know, you go through a house inspector, someone who goes through, and you want them to go through and find anything that's not right. Amen. Well, that's what you're doing. You're asking, you know, you know, you, you've moved into this home, and I want you to look around and see if there's something that needs repairing, right? And we'll get right on that together. Amen. Uh, this is, but, but not being done in a condemning, um, uh, self-judging, self, you know, diagnostic way, but. Asking him, inviting him in, because if your end game is for him to be Lord, well, then allow him to be Lord during the searching process, too. Right? To say, you know, I'm asking you as my Lord, you point out what is not right, what is wicked, what is twisted in me. And the Lord didn't lead me in the way of everlasting. Because even if he told you what was wrong, you would know how to fix it if he didn't lead you. Right. Lead me in the way of everlasting. Right? Yes, George. You were saying that he wanted where you end up with being convicted, but not condemned. That's right, yes. There's nothing wrong with, in fact, one of the most restorative, most wonderful things you can have in your life is conviction. Yes. Conviction is a wonderful thing. I, I mean, I, I know the difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation stinks. Conviction is restoring. Yes. Conviction, may, it grounds you, and it, it, it reawakens the fear of the Lord in your heart, by which I mean the deep respect for him. Not a fear. Clean and it's not, holy. Yeah, it's clean and it's holy. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. It is purifying. And 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 the process of going through that conviction and being restored in that area. You if you do it the way God is intending to do it, the entire time you feel like you're being bear hugged. There's nothing condemning about it. It's so restorative and so freeing and so cleansing that it's something that you're thinking, gosh. I wish you'd show me something wrong with me every day, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> yeah, it's because it's it's it really is. It restores the whole, the heart. It restores the soul. Then you find yourself connected in a way, in a deeper way than you were before. So yes, examine yourself by the word of God and by invitation. Invite him into it. The next thing was to be prepared for his return. How? How are you pre prepared for his return? Stay in his word. That is kind of part of it. Keeping his statutes. Okay. Constantly looking for him. Not, not just saying, well, maybe someday. Or maybe yeah, maybe we definitely someday. maintain the hope of his return yes. is a big part of it. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, wouldn't it be like this parable that we've been studying being about his business? Being about his business. His business. That's it. That's right. How I how am I prepared for his return? I'm doing business until he returns. I'm busy doing the work of the kingdom, which is breaking down into two simple statements. It's the expanding the kingdom reign of Jesus Christ in my own heart, and then being a tool in his hand to expand it in other people's hearts. That's the work of the kingdom, right? Amen. Amen. And preoccupied. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. So if I want to be prepared for his return, I do that by being doing business until he returns, right? I mean, the, one thing you see over and over again, not only here and not only in the parable of the talents, but you also see it in other areas where Jesus was just talking, where he says, blessed is that servant whom his master finds so doing when he returns, Amen. right? Mm -hmm. Not having done at some time before he returned, but when he got back, he was actually taking a nap. No, 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 no. He, he was busy. When, he, when Jesus showed up, uh, it, it, he found him still working, still busy, right? Doing the work of the kingdom. Amen? Yes? yes. So the, now the third one was be a surrendered servant, which is kind of self-explanatory as well as being a faithful servant. Both of those in large are attached to the fear of the Lord. Being a surrendered servant, the bowing of the knee, perpetual bowing of the knee. It's giving him his lordship, Right? It's acknowledging that he is the one that is your master and you are the one that is his servant. It's a surrendered servant, which also means I'm surrendering my own will. Jesus gave us a great example of it, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. It didn't mean, you notice that in that, it didn't mean you couldn't ask the Lord, is there some other way? Clearly you can. Our Lord did that with his, right? But once you get the final word, you're like, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Why? Because Jesus allow the Father to be his master. Amen? And so in turn, I allowed Christ to be mine. Amen? And so that is a conversation we have regularly, right? 
when, when, he lead, when he does wind up leading me in the way of everlasting, I don't say, oh, if I'd known it was going to cost that, I might have said something different. But no, no, no. As soon as I find out whatever the way of life is, I walk in it. Amen? Not my will, but yours. And sometimes it's not always pleasant, but it's going to be what he wants. Amen? And then a faithful servant just means it's ongoing and it's continuous. I don't just have on days, I have an on life. Right? It's the normal way. And you remember our, our key um, uh, verse, or our, 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 I'm sorry, our focus verse has always been 2 Peter 3, verse 11 and 12, where it says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? In holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. So, let's read this parable through once. Luke 19, verses 11 through 27. And they were listening, uh, so as they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. That's why he did this. Therefore, he said, because they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away, because of that, he said, a nobleman traveled to a far country. So what we're about to read is definitely talking about the kingdom of God, aren't we? Yes. A nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king and then return. He called ten of his, his slaves, or his servants, gave them ten, ten minas, or one mina each, and told them, engage in business until I come back. But his subjects, not his servants, but his subjects, hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. At his return, having received authority to be king, he summoned those servants he had given the money to so he could find out how much they had made in business. The first came forward and said, Master, your mina has earned ten minas more. Well done, good servant, he told him, because you have been faithful in a very small matter. In a very small matter. Have authority over ten towns. So God is telling us that if you're just doing business until I return, you've been faithful over a very small matter. This is not a big deal. I haven't asked too much of you. A very small matter. Not a small matter. A very small matter. Was it? Yeah, it's mustard seed. Yeah. yeah we're, not, we're, not, we're not going out there with mountain faith. We're just talking about mustard seed stuff, right? Right? This is simple things. If you will just be about my kingdom's business, the kingdom rule in your own heart and then establishing in the hearts of others, you've done a very little thing, but hey, you did it, right? Amen? So he says that you've been faithful in a very small matter. Have authority over 10 towns. The second came and said, Master, your mina has made five minas. So he said, you will be over five towns. And another came and said, Master, here is your mina. I have kept it hidden away in a cloth. That reminds me of, um, uh, of the salt and light analogy, right? Where he says, don't, don't, um, don't hide your light under a bushel, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, a man doesn't light a, a candle to put it under a bushel, but that might give light to all that are in the house. But this guy stuck it under a bushel, didn't he? Yes. I hid it, right? He says, uh, Master, here's your mean. I have kept it hidden away in a cloth because I was afraid of you. That doesn't show relationship, does it? I was afraid of you, for you're a tough man. You collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you did not sow. Well, wait a minute. I thought that the mina that he had came from him. Right? Well, then he did deposit. He did sow. And he's coming back to reap what he did sow. So he's completely mischaracterized his nobleman, hasn't he? And he should have known better because his nobleman gave him money. It wasn't his money, it was his nobleman's. And yet he's accusing him of coming back to reap what he never gave. And yet out of his own mouth, he was just giving back what was his. His argument makes no sense. Right? It sounds a lot like politics today, doesn't it? It just makes no sense. So he's like, you know, here, have what is yours, the meaning you gave me. I can't get hit away. Uh, you know, I, and I did that because I was afraid of you, because I know you gather what you didn't give. Huh? Right? What, what, what are you talking about? You, you just gave him back the meaning he gave you. He did give something, didn't he? And yet you're claiming that he tries to gather what he didn't sow, but he did sow. Amen? He says, Master, here's your mina. I have kept it hidden away in a cloth because I was afraid of you, for you are a tough man. He didn't know him at all. You collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you did not sow. 
He told him, I will judge you by what you have said. The pattern of God, isn't it? I will judge you by what you have said, you evil servant. If you knew I was a tough man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow, in other words, if you knew I was a thief, right, why did you not put my money in the bank? And when I returned, I would have collected it with interest. So he said to those standing there, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten. But they said to Master, he already has ten. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. And from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. But bring here the, these, enemy, these enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. Now, so what we've covered so far, what we've learned so far, has been these points right here. The nobleman is Jesus. He was to be king. The ten servants were his. All the subjects in the kingdom were not his. Those are the people, he said, that did not want him to rule over us, right? So the ten servants were his. He invested much in them. Now, the mina is represented by real things for you and I, like redemption and the ministry of reconciliation, forgiveness, restoration, gifts, hope. He deposited these things in us, not to mention his own character has been placed on the inside of us. Amen. So we have received a mina from our king. It's like, do business with this until I return. Do business with the redemption that I've given you. The fact that I bought you back. Well, that can teach a lot of things to a lot of people, can't it? Uh, forgiveness. You have been forgiven, so therefore you forgive, forgive, forgive. right? Yeah. In fact, he says, you must do this, or your Father in Heaven will not forgive you. Right. Your trespasses, right? Restoration. You have been restored into right relationship with God. So what is the ministry that we teach? It's a ministry of restoration. Right. We tell people that you can be reconciled to God. We've been given gifts that facilitate doing this work, Right? And we also have a great hope. And we, I listed three of them for you the other day, last week. One of them was the fact that our bodies will be redeemed. One day, this body will no longer fight you. Amen? Not only in health, but more specifically, it will not fight you in honoring God. Right? Because remember, the Bible says in Galatians that the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit lusts against the flesh. And these two are contrary to one another, which is why you sometimes find yourself doing what you wish you didn't. Well, that battle is going to be in an end one day. It's a great hope because my flesh will no longer fight me then. Amen? Thank you, Lord. That is a great hope, isn't it? The other great hope is that Christ will be formed in me. Amen? Amen. That is the great hope of the child of God, that we will bear his image. And the last thing was that he's going to return. I'm not going to just be stuck on this planet without seeing him, but forever I will see him face to face, eye to eye. Amen? For an eternity. Amen? So we have a great hope, don't we? And so these are things he's deposited on the inside of us. If we had been, if we are faithful servants, we are looking <laughs> forward to his return. If I'm the, if I'm the guy with the ten talents or the, the ten minas, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, that's got increased to ten minas, or the guy who's increased to five minas, I am looking forward to his return. Amen? Because the people that are about this, the Father's business are looking forward to seeing the Father. They want him to come back. The other guy is hiding because he thinks he's mean and tough and is not looking forward to his return. Right? Yeah. So that's another key, isn't it? Yeah. If you are not anticipating his return with great anticipation, you need to be looking at your heart. Because I'm telling you, if you're living the way you need to be living, if you're doing business until the king returns, I'm telling you, you're looking forward to it. He could come back at any moment, and you would never say it was too soon. Uh, Amen? Amen? Never once. Yeah. Then, he commanded us to engage in business until he returns. This has served as our key and central focus this entire time. We discovered that business meant to be busy and occupied producing gain for the kingdom from what was invested in us. God's not expecting you to be a Paul if he didn't put the deposit of a Paul in you. Hello? Some people, he put the, the, the deposit of, 
um, a, a Dorcas. Remember, she was the woman who who, who sewed and knit stuff and, and gave it to the, um, the brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that was her calling. And she was a prayer, I think, as well. So that's what she did. And that was no less important than the Pauls. God just wants whatever you did, be you've got, be faithful over it. Amen? 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 He's not giving every, you, you see from the, I mean, now in this talent, this example that you see, he gave a mina to each one. If you went over there to the power pair of the talents in, in Matthew chapter 25, he gave different amounts to each person, right? He gave uh, 10 to one and five to another and whatever to another. And, but they all showed a, a, an increase, didn't they, right? So, you know, uh, and, and both of them are kind of teaching the same thing kind of from a different angle. So, you know, with the, with the 10 and the five, it shows different kinds of giftings. Remember, what does the Bible say? It says, each one, as each one has received a gift, minister to one another as faithful stewards over the gift of the grace of God. He says, if anyone prophesies, let him do it with the, uh, the, the uh, um, I'm sorry, yeah, let him do it in proportion to his faith, right? Yeah. In another place, I think it's in the book of Romans where it talks about the gifts, it says that God has given to each one a measure of faith, not the measure. The measure has to do with salvation. A measure has to do with your gifts. So some people have given, been given prophecy, but they've been given ten minas of it. Another person's been given prophecy, but they were given one mina of it. He's asking the one mina guy and the ten mina guy, I mean the guy the same thing. Do business until I return. He's not expecting the results out of the one mina guy that the ten mina guy had. Are you following? He was given more to begin with. Hello? Yes. Are you following? Am I making any sense to you? So, I mean, in that respect, he's talking about what has been entrusted into your hand. But something was entrusted into everyone's hands, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody who's in the body of Christ, something was entrusted to you. This can be reduced, the entire thing, of, like I've said before already, at least twice today, but it's important to, the more I say it, I'm hoping it's going to get ingrained in you. All of this can be reduced down to allowing Christ to be formed in you and forming it in others. Furthering the kingdom, the rule and the reign of Christ in your own life and seeking to further that rule and reign in other people's lives, mm -hmm. right? And I gave you a whole bunch of examples. I'm not going to go through them now because uh, we've been through them again. Um, but uh, we also, uh, according, according to, this, uh, to um, uh, the, the outline of this passage, we saw that God deals with his people first, don't, doesn't he? Yes. He always deals with his people first. And so we broke down this kingdom living into two groups of people, how I deal with the world and how I deal with the body of Christ, right? Because mm -hmm. they're not the same people, are they? No. And with believers, we're supposed to minister to their spiritual and their natural needs. We're to be like-minded, sympathetic, compassionate, willing to suffer for one another, avoiding sibling squabbles and walk in love. Amen? <laughs> because one of the things that Jesus said is that the world will know you belong to me and follow me if they see your love for one another. Right? See, I see a church that is completely evangel evangelist, um, evangelical, that I mean, that is their entire focus, and it's not about growth and ministering to one another in the body of Christ, then they're going to fail. Because they might go out there with the message, but the message is largely not going to be heard because the only way, the first thing that kicks open the door to listen to your words is looking at your life. And they're only going to know that you belong to the Lord that you are preaching if you love one another. Which is why, guys, it starts in the family first. Don't go out and do that if you haven't done this, right? That'd be like going out and seeing to it that, you know, um, uh, you know your, your neighbor's kids are fed before you fed your own kids, Right? It works from the inside out, amen? Yes. Which is why we try to, and, and, and Steve pressed it one time when we were looking at the way that we give, always do something here local as well. You know, I mean, uh, on our own shores, don't, you know, don't do everything going out, amen? Something needs to be here. Yes. So you're doing something in your own backyards, but that doesn't, it's not to the elimination of doing things in other people's backyard, but at least do something in your own, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be like-minded towards one another, sympathetic, compassionate, willing to suffer for one another, avoid sibling squabbles. Lord, we need to know that one. The body of Christ, we have just got to learn to get along, right, you know, and not fight with one another, and not be touchy and, and not fretful and resentful and, and irritated and all that other stuff. Walking in love, right? Yes. Amen. And then when it came to do with the world, you know, it tells us that we are supposed to be uh, 
um, salt and light. We're supposed to uh, um, be gentle and respectful towards people in the world. And this is something, again, I see. And I take little samples of it, not only in my own life, but also I see it a lot in uh, the, the things I see on Facebook. With Because uh, uh, you get a sample of what people are really thinking, you know? And uh, what, you, what I see is a lot of retaliatory things. You don't see a lot of this walking, a lot of you find defensiveness. You know, when, uh, if, the, if the world is doing something, then uh, they get all up in, uh, in arms about it. I'm not saying it's wrong to make a political statement, especially if you're pointing something out that you believe is right. That's not a bad thing. But what I'm saying is when, when someone is not, when an ungodly person is not walking godly and you turn it into a tirade, you know, what do you expect them to do? They're not born again. Yeah, I, I, what ought to be upsetting you is the fact that that very same thing that person in the world is doing is happening in the body of Christ and you're not saying anything. In fact, a lot of times maybe that person might be you when you've said nothing, right? That's the problem, right? <laughs> so, you know, so we, we need to make sure that when we're dealing with the world, we are not being antagonistic because there's two offenses. We create two. The gospel was only supposed to have one offense, the gospel was only supposed to have one offense, not two. The offense was supposed to be Jesus. His own character is offensive to the world because it's light in their darkness. Amen. Right? The, we do not need to add to that offense being pig-headed, deliberate, defiant, and nasty to the world. That's a second offense. They never get a chance to be offended at Jesus because they got offended at you first. Hello? Trust me, Jesus will offend them enough. You don't need to offend them further, right? Does that make sense? We do, if we're working with the world, we do, we're not defensive. We're not um, attacking. We need to be ingratiating. We need to be kind. Now, are there times when the Lord will, just, will, will rise up on the inside of you and cause you to just put things in order? Yes. From time to time, you even see that in Jesus' ministry. But about the only people you really see him doing that with were people who were religious. He didn't really, you don't see him going to prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors and reading the right at. You don't usually see that. What you see that with people that were hypocritical, who were claiming they were godly, but they weren't. Then he kind of pulled up the carpet, right? Are you following me? Yeah. So with the world, we need to not be offensive towards them. That does not mean that our gospel is not offensive. I mean, you aren't offensive. You do know what I mean by yes. that, right? So we are never to retaliate or defend ourselves, but seek to bless. In this parable, we learned that the world are the subjects who do not want the nobleman to rule over them. So our job is to be, is, is like uh, Del Tackett said in the Truth Project, to be winsome, you know. Uh, uh, live in such a way where the idea of living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ is ingratiating, not offensive. Amen. They're already, you can't remove the offense of the gospel. You can't remove the offense of the cross. It's going to be there. But I'm telling you, people are willing to die for something that they see as willing to die for. Right? If they see a life that's surrendered to Christ, and they see a person who's living in eternal peace, and, and, and yeah. it has ha genuine happiness, genuine joy, does not get destroyed when terrible things happen in their life, but they live with this perpetual hope that seems to be like, like, uh, like a, a wind under their wings that keeps them almost hovering through life, and you're like, you know, that person, uh, uh, the world is looking at that, they're like, you know, that is something I want. What's it going to cost me? It's going to cost you everything. You know what? And you'll actually get some takers. You won't get a lot, but you'll get some. But at least the people who are willing to um, enter into that gospel did so knowing that it's not a sidestep of problems. It's in the middle of it, I stay dedicated to Christ. Amen? Amen. That I am in the kingdom, and I do bow the knee to another Lord, and I do not live from my own ways. So, now the other thing was... Uh, the world rejects Jesus and his servants, his message and his messengers, the life he gave and the life they live, their testimony. They reject all of it. They reject that. These are the people who sent the delegation and said, we do not want this man to rule over us. Amen? It's the same group of people. Finally, we learned that the ten servants are placed into three categories. The good and faithful, the one that did work, and the guy that did nothing. You got three categories, right? 
The one guy who came back and, and, and had shown a marked increase, that person, Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a very little thing. Now be ruler over much, over ten cities, right? And to the guy who had five, he said, he said, um, you will be ruler over five cities. And we already know what he said to the last guy it wasn't good, right? So he had three different people. Now, that, remember, there were ten people. Uh, I mean, were there ten servants that he gave stuff to? But he only, he only, in the parable, he only addresses three. So he's addressing three categories of people, isn't he? Yeah. Right? Those who did a hundredfold, those who did thirtyfold, and those who did no fold at all. Right? Then, uh, then we read Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22 last week. And I'm not going to turn there again. But it was important because it illustrated this. Jesus addressed his servants in Laodicea. You remember the Laodicean church, right? And this is in this letters. Remember the letters that Jesus had written to the churches, um, the early church. And this one's in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. He addressed his servants in the Laodicean church. What was the problem with the Laodicean church? What were they like? Lazy. Yeah. Lazy. They were lazy. They weren't just living necessarily. He didn't really address that you're living in a whole bunch of sin. He just said you're doing nothing. You're you're lazy. Uh, he called them lukewarm, right? You know, Jesus had a way of, of, of regularly bringing up things in a context that would be relevant to people. Um, uh, Laodicea was known um, all, all over that part of the world for their ISAF. That's what they made, was ISAF. that had healing properties to it. But another thing about Laodicea was their aqueducts had warm water in it. Their aqueducts had warm water in it. It was a, a warm, I think it was a warm, it was fed by a warm spring. And so their water was uh, not that great. It wasn't cold. It was lukewarm, right? And so Jesus uses both of these analogies in talking to them. He said, you say that you're, you are, um, you're, you're, your self-assessment is that you are better off spiritual than you really are. You say we are, we are rich and we don't have need of anything, and yet I'm telling you, you are poor, miserable, blind. I say blind and naked, and you don't even know it, right? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, which is to say righteousness, righteous living, gold, godliness, right? And I said, to anoint your eyes that you may say. In other words, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, that you might have spiritual eyes to see what is truly valuable. Because they were looking at their life and saying, we're rich and have need of nothing. It's like, well, you're rich in the wrong things. You need to have eyes to see what's truly valuable. Because in those areas, you are dirt poor. Right? Now he's talking to his church, isn't he? This is the body of Christ. This isn't, he's not talking to a church building with people in it who don't know him. He's talking to his own, right? Which is why he later in that same group, in that same passage, said, "Those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten every son I receive." Right? Mm -hmm. These are his kids, aren't they? Yes. Right? And he goes on. And he says, um, "He says, if you would commit yourself to perpetual and real communion with me, in other words, I stand at the door and knock." If you'll let me in and have communion, perpetual and real communion with me, you will wind up overcoming the world and the victor will rule and reign with me. Sounds a lot like our parable, doesn't it? If you, if you do the business until I return, you will rule and you will reign. Amen? So in Luke 19, verse 20 through 26, this is dealing with the last guy. And you, uh, it says, and another came and said, Master, here is your mina. I've kept it hidden away in a cloth because I was afraid of you, for you were a tough man. You collected what you didn't deposit, reap what you did not sow. He told him, I'll judge you by what you said, you evil slave. If you knew I was a tough man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow, why did you not put my money in the bank? And when I returned, I would have collected it with interest. So he said to those standing there, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten. But they said, Master, he already has ten minas. I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. More will be given because you've been faithful over little, haven't you? Right? More will be given. And from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. So this third servant was not faithful in his work. He did not do business until the nobleman returned. Now remember, all of these were his servants. Every last one. They were separated and different than the, the subjects who did not want him ruling over them. 
the ones that didn't want to rule over him are ones that said, no, uh, -uh. we will not have him be our master. We will not have him be our Lord. In other words, in our uh, taking it from the parable into real life, there are people that rejected the Lordship of Jesus Christ would not be his, right? The ten servants are people who had bowed the knee to him. They were already his, he was already their Lord. But one of the servants of his, at least one, at least one of the, the, the category of one, did nothing with what it was given to him. Absolutely nothing. And remember, what was that translated into? It, they, they failed to form Christ within them, and they failed to encourage Christ without. They failed to form Christ within them, the fruit and the character change. And they failed to encourage Christ outside of them, to be a living witness, to share the gospel, to be salt and like. They were like the world, hanging out with them, seeking their friendship, valuing what they value. I'm going to offer an example of that, a scriptural example of that in a minute. This king took even what he had and gave it to the one who was most faithful and shamed him for his laziness and unfaithfulness. And this servant, uh, this, uh, this servant proved to not know him at all. Now, you know, we did bring up last week, and I'll just give this as an example. This is where I was going to bring it up, and someone asked the question last week, and that kind of forced me to bring it up then, which was good. I like questions. I'm not saying that was bad. It was good. But here's where I was going to bring it up, and that is people ask the question, well, what about the guy on the cross? You know, he got born again, so to speak, but he didn't do anything. He was hanging on a tree. What's he going to do, right? It's not like he went out and preached the gospel. It's not like he lived a godly life and until he died. I mean, maybe he did for the whole 10 minutes it was left. But, you know, what What about him? You know, when the master comes back, what's he going to say? Um, okay, well, you're an exception to the rule because you didn't get any minas, and therefore you didn't have any minas to do anything with. You still come in. No, 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 no. No, no. He did have a mina, and he did do something with it, didn't he? I mean, this guy is saying, you realize that it doesn't matter. And that this is, this is a lesson all on its own. And I'm telling you, it could teach you a lot about yourself. Human beings. This is something that has amazed me as I've gotten older. I am amazed that the things that guided behavior in high school still guide people's behavior in their 60s and 70s. I am completely awestruck by that. I, I, I have no bag to put that in. None. None. It doesn't make, I mean, it did, to me, it didn't make sense in high school. In high school, I did not care what anybody thought about me. It didn't even occur to me to care. I did what I felt was the right thing to do, period. Which is why, you know, I carried my Bible with me everywhere. We had Bible studies. I led them, you know, and that kind of stuff. And it, it, it did not occur to me that to care that someone didn't like me because of that. Because in my mind, I was thinking, this is the way I reasoned it. And I have no doubt that it was because God gave me the light to see it this way. I'm not making it a personal virtue. I'm just saying that I know that God gave me the light for this. And that was, I didn't want to be liked for something I wasn't. Because then it wasn't really liking me. They didn't really like me. They liked what I'm, a show I'm putting on. And that felt hollow. And probably one thing that added to my desire to not do that was the fact that I was short. And I already felt a little ostracized in some respects and, um, and never really felt, was not really confident. And the weird thing that doesn't make any sense is I was, I was ridiculously confident with women. I had no problem getting a girlfriend. But for whatever reason, I just, I lacked confidence in, in general life because I was shorter than the other guys, right? And so with that in my mind, I, I just, I already felt, whether there was really real rejection or not, I felt it. And so I'm like, you know, if I'm being rejected for what I am, I don't want to be accepted for what I'm not. That's what I kind of calculated in my head. I don't want to be that guy that's out there trying to get other people's acceptance by what I do, and at the end of the day, I have to look at myself in the mirror and say, you're lying. You're not even that person. They don't even really like you. They like what you're doing. So I just made the determination, I'm just going to be what I am, and people are going to hate me or like me. And just forget it. I just, I don't care. And so, and it wasn't I didn't care. There was a little bit of defensiveness in there at the same time, but I didn't allow it to guard, guide my, the way I did and what I did, right? And so when I was around that in high school, I looked at them, and then the people in high school, I could tell even the most insecure people in the entire high school were the most popular. 
It was obvious to me. It was like blinders were off me, and I was able to walk around and see the insecurity that was just pouring out of people's pores all around me. And I thought, dang, I thought I was insecure, you know? And, I, and you know, I thought, well, you know, real life will hit them. They'll get a job, and life will start, and they'll get past that. Now, I'm running into some of these people, and they're in their 50s and 60s now, and I'm like, they are the same thing that they were back then. They're still living for the approval of other people. They still have absolutely no backbone whatsoever. And I'm like, how is that humanly possible? I thought that's something you left on the playground. Not something that you carry into adulthood. Surely that's not possible. And yet, the more I look around, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. You know, so, you know, our, our Lord needs to be that person. The person whose opinion we care about. Everybody else's opinion, who cares what they think? Right? I mean, what, that's what Paul said. He says, you know, it's a very small thing that I be judged by you. I have one guy I'm judged by, and you ain't him. And it's a very small matter to me that I'm judged by you. Right? Because in the end, that doesn't do anything for me or against me. It, it's nothing. Right? So, you know, this, uh, now, the reason I bring that up is because the guy on the cross. You would be surprised, even in the face of death, what people will and will not say because they're still afraid of being rejected by peers. Even on people's, I have seen people, heard of people who literally on their deathbed would not confess Jesus, not because they were not convinced of it, but because of the fact that people did not approve were in the room. And they died. The fear of man brings a snare. Right? I'm telling you, it is, it's unbelievable. So this guy on the cross, you think, well, what did he have to lose? The same thing the guy that anybody has to lose. Their reputation. You're like, well, he already has no reputation. He's hanging on a cross. Uh, don't be fooled. I'm telling you, human beings will carry what little bit of what they think is dignity to the grave with them if they can. I'm telling you it's the truth. And that man said, you know what? I deserve to be here. You have done nothing wrong. And he called him master and asked him, I'm asking you, please, when you go into your kingdom, will you remember me? Right? He was showing humility in the face of all of his judges, everybody who thought the worst of him, and he didn't, he'd given up the care of it. Maybe it took hanging on a cross to get there for that guy. I guarantee to you today he does not regret being on the cross that day. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Far better than if he had lived <laughs> on a long life and died in his sins. Right? But he did do something on the cross. He received forgiveness, which means he had to believe in the goodness of the nobleman. Yes. Right? He had to see a nobleman even though he was hanging on a cross. He had to see nobility in someone that they criminalized. Right? He had better eyes to see than most Christians do. Right? So, yeah, did he do something? Absolutely. I bet you he's probably going to be the guy with the ten minas. I might be the guy with the five, but he will definitely be the guy with the ten. Right? Because you know what? And the only time that it mattered, he stood up. He identified himself with Christ. He humbled himself underneath him. He acknowledged him as king and ruler. He didn't have very... You, you need to understand, on a cross, you don't waste breaths because they're hard to come by. You can't breathe on a cross. That's the reason why you die. You die of asphyxiation. Every word he said cost him. You had to push up in order to exhale and draw in another breath. Your, your lungs stay in an open position the entire time on the cross. And so you have to push up against the nails just to exhale and draw in another breath. And it's ridiculously painful. Incredibly painful. And he chose with those precious few breaths he had to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ and identify with him and call him noble and acknowledge that he was not noble himself. Yeah, he did something. I'd say he did something, right? So look with you, with me, if you will, uh, in our closing. Let's go ahead and turn to, um, uh, let's see, I got a uh, passage here. Let's turn to, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at uh, the first 15 verses. And we may not get much further than that because uh, I have one more passage, and we may just make those, those next two passages may be just what we spend time with next week in more of a discussion kind of thing than a teaching kind of thing. Um, this is entirely um, 
Let's see. Yeah, as you're turning there to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let me read this to you real quickly, okay? Um, I, I'm, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting the first verse, okay? I'm reading to you from another place. Just stay where you are in 1 Corinthians. But it says, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour that your Lord is coming. Is that applicable to the parable we're looking at? Yes. Yes. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the hour in which your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. All of that also speaks to suddenness, doesn't it? Remember, I told you the word when the, Lord, when the Bible talked about, Behold, I come quickly and the his soon return, both of those words mean sudden. They don't mean quick in time. It's not like God doesn't realize 2,000 years is a long time. Even for even on God's scale, it's a long time, right? So, uh, I mean, he looked at, at, at um, the patriarchs and said they were given a long life, and that was like 120 years. So I'd say 2,000 would be longer, wouldn't it, right? Yes. So we're not talking about length of time. We're talking about suddenness. He says, behold, I come quickly, meaning suddenly, in a time you're not expecting. It's going to catch you off guard, right? He says, therefore... You also be ready for the Son of God is coming, Son of Man is coming in an hour that you don't expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, finds so doing. Now listen to those words. Who is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? In other words, now that's that is kind of tricky language. What he's saying there, that's actually doing business until he comes. He said, you know, I've given you something to work with and are you feeding people with it? Are you doing something with it? Amen. And he says, blessed is that servant whom his master finds doing those things when he returns. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master delays his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. What's he doing? He's being an, he's being a enemy to the body of Christ and a friend of the world. Right? It's exactly what James talks about. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that your friendship with the world makes you God's enemy? Makes you God's enemy. He was talking to Christians, wasn't he, in James? Yes or no? He was talking to Christians. He says, do you not know that your friendship, your alliance with the world has made you God's enemy? The very people that he says, bring those people who would not have me serve them, have me rule over them before me and slaughter them in my presence, my enemies. I don't want to be that guy. Hello? I do not want to be that guy. Uh, you, you, do, you, do you identify with that? Do you, I hope yeah. that's the same desire you have, yes. right? He says, Assuredly, I say to you, he will make him rule over all of his goods. But that evil servant that says in his heart, My master did delays his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and an hour when he's not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him a portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So with that in mind, we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And brethren, because you know it's imperative that we understand that we don't misunderstand the parables and mix them, okay? Because we need to know the intended audience when Jesus is speaking, which is why I spent a lot of time, you probably felt like I spent way too much time with it, but I can't overstate this. The, the people who were subjects in the kingdom were not his servants. They did not belong to him. They sent a delegation saying, I will not let that man be my Lord. They said that from the beginning. They were never committed to him. They were outside the body, so to speak, right? The ten servants were his. They belonged to him. And if you don't keep that in perfect alignment, you're going to miss what he says. Amen? It's very important. This entire this, That whole narrative I just read to you is entirely different from the child of God who does, in fact, do some work for the kingdom, but is lagging in diligence. This one may suffer loss, but will still be saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse um, uh, 1 through 15, and that's how we'll end. 
And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babies in Christ. Now hold on to that. He says, a baby in Christ and a carnal person can be the same thing. Is that not what's in that verse? Look, uh, read it for yourself, quietly. Just read it to yourself, verse 1, and then tell me, is that what it says? It does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babies in Christ. So carnal and baby is the same thing. Yeah. A baby in Christ is someone who identifies more with their flesh than the spirit. Because Remember the, the struggle that's going on. That's what, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these two are contrary to another. This is why you sometimes don't do what you desire to do. Well, the baby is often doing what they wish they didn't do, because they side more with their flesh. Doesn't mean they're not born again. Doesn't mean they don't produce any fruit. It just means that at the moment, they're producing more fruit that's bad than good. But they are producing good fruit. Hello? Yes? So he says, I fed you with milk and not solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you're still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there is envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving as mere unchanged men? That right there... Ladies and gentlemen, represent the greatest person of the body of Christ. What's he say here? As long as you still envy and have strife among you and divisions among you, you are babies. That is to say, carnal. Wow. That locked tight a good portion of the body of Christ right there in one sentence, didn't it? He said, you're acting as mere unchanged men. Behaving like. He didn't say you are unchanged. He said you're acting like you weren't changed. Yeah. Hold on to those words. This is very important. He was very deliberate in what he said. He's not saying because of this you're not born again. He's saying you're acting like you're not. Hello? As long, not, not all the time, but whenever you do get in strife, yeah, you're acting like you were never changed. Whenever you do get into envy, yeah, you're acting like you were never changed. When you break into divisions among you and, and won't associate with some other Christians because they're, they're of that sort, yeah, you're acting like a baby, right? And as a baby, you're acting like you never met me, right? Didn't say you hadn't. You're acting like you hadn't, right? For when one says, I'm of a Paul or I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Or let's just go ahead and bring this up to the modern day. When one person says, well, I'm a Baptist, and the other person says, I'm a Methodist. Are you not carnal and acting like a baby? That is what it says here. It's petty. It's childish. Who then is Paul? Who then is Paul, Apollos? But ministers through whom ye believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God's the one that gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. The only one that makes any difference is God here. Right? Now, he who plants and he who waters, whether you believe it or not, whether it looks like it or not, they're actually one. You're turning them into two, but they're actually one. You know, the Baptists and the Methodists are one. They turn it into two, but they're really one. Yes? He says, so then... Um, he who, uh, uh, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters is anything, but God gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So what's he doing? They're doing business, aren't they? Until he returns. Yes? For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, or in other words, as an apostle, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. So now let's talk about now the, the, the foundation has been laid and that is Jesus Christ, right? But you know, it's not just teachers who build on that. You build on that, don't you? Right? As a child of God, I build on the foundation of Jesus Christ and my brothers and sisters and in my own life, and you guys build on my foundation too, don't you? Yeah. There is no big means, little use in the body of Christ. It does not exist. Everybody ministers to one another. There, remember, what does it say in Ephesians? Increase is caused by every joint that is there giving and doing its share, causing increase in the body. Amen. That is the increase Jesus is coming back looking for. Did you do business? Did you make a profit while I was gone? Right? Causing increase in the body with each part doing its share. 
Verse 8, now he, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another is built upon it. But let each person take heed, or in other words, be careful how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which has already been laid, and that's Jesus. So let, let's just finish that one right there. The foundation has been laid. There are no other foundations. We're just building on it, right? Now, if anyone builds on the foundation of Jesus Christ with gold, silver, and precious stones, I'm, I'm kind of metaphoring here. If someone's building on the, the foundation of Jesus Christ with gold, silver, and precious stones, then they're using materials that are fit for that foundation, right? But if you build on the foundation of Jesus Christ with things like wood, hay, and stubble, you are using things that are foreign to that foundation, right? You're building something on Jesus Christ that doesn't belong to Jesus, right? And, you're, and what's worse is when we build it on Jesus, we call it Jesus when it's not Jesus, right? Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, that same fire that's going to destroy the works that are in it. Remember, we read that in Peter, right? Knowing, therefore, that the world will be destroyed and the works that are in it, right? And that what we read in Peter, right? He says, what manner of men should you decide to be if you know your works are going to go through fire? We're reading about it right here, aren't we? He says, now if anyone builds on the foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one work will become clear what it was. For the day will make it obvious because it will be revealed by fire. It'll try it. And the fire will test or try each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved so as through fire. Right? You yourself are still saved. So in other words, the guy that did not produce any, did not produce increase, literally didn't produce any increase. None. He did nothing. He did nothing. He hid it, and he probably did everything he can to associate with the world, with those people who said, we will not have him rule over us, right? But you cannot, you cannot rub shoulders with them and rub shoulders with the ones that are being faithful at the same time because the people that you're trying to get chummy with over here in the world will see that you're, you're hanging out with those Christians, right? So in order to be the guy who's being chummy with the world, you're going to have to be hostile against Christians, which is what he said in that thing I read to you earlier. My master delays his coming. And he begins to beat his fellow servants and begins to go out and eat and drink with the drunkards, associating with the people of the world, but spurning people that he should call brother. Right? He says when he comes back, he's going to come back on a day he's not seeing it coming. Right? The Bible tells us that even though Jesus is going to return suddenly, he said, you are not in the dark so that that day should catch you as unaware. There's going to be an awareness on the inside. We won't know the day, but there's going to be an awareness that, you know, it's getting close. You know what I mean? But the person who is a who has made a commitment to Jesus but is living in the world, it's going to catch them completely off guard. They will not know it was coming at all. You and I, those that are walking close, no wonder we'll know because we're, we're already close to him, right? If you are close to him, you're going to know. Uh, isn't that true? If you know somebody, if you're close to someone, then if something is coming up, you can kind of pick it up in the way they act. You know, they kind of got a bounce in their step or they got a silly grin or something. You know, something's up and it makes you ask, what's up? Well, what, what's going on? Right? Well, this is exact. I mean, you smile at that, but it really is the same thing. That's what's going to happen. Before Jesus' return, there's going to be this anticipation. The Holy Spirit's like, oh, I'm going to get to pick him up any minute. And, and we're like, you know, what you got that grin on your face for, Holy Spirit? What, what's going on, right? What, what's, you're excited about something. What is it, right? Come on, tell me. You can tell me. No, I can't. Yeah, you can. No, I can't. Yeah, you're going to like it, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean we, we make fun, but it's, it really is. That is the kind of banter that, in a manner of speaking, takes place because we know him and we're close to him. And what he when he's beginning to, to swell in anticipation, we're going to be like, oh, yeah, something good's coming. Right, you're you're aware, and you're you're, and that makes you all the more diligent. Because remember, those who maintain this hope in themselves purify themselves. Right, 
So, you know, none of this is a, this entire parable is only scary to the guy who wants to be chummy with the world. The guy who's an adulteress and, and uh, that is uh, deciding that, you know, that they want to have friendship with the world. Then they made themselves God, God's enemy, right? Where do, you, where do you draw the line between um, helping and ministering to someone and hanging out with that person? <clears throat> You're trying. You're trying to minister to them, mm -hmm. but and but you're not supposed to be hang out around them. So okay. Then, by I mean, hang out by hang out around them. That's that's a that's a, a, a difficult one. Paul, it's not really difficult, but it's it's, it's harder mm -hmm. to talk to. Paul um, talked about the fact. He said, if any of you have an unbeliever that invites you to dinner and you want to go, go. He says, but don't ask anything for conscience sake because they're probably going to feed you food uh, serve, uh, from an idol's temple. And if you eat it in front of them, then you're going to be preaching a gospel that's inconsistent with Jesus. So don't ask. But if they do tell you, don't eat. Right? So, you know, so he already kind of gives us predicates the kind of relationship. If a sinner asks you to dinner and you want to go, go. Which is to say, if you really don't want to go, don't feel obligation to go. Right? Don't feel like you're doing God a favor by going to a dinner party that you were invited to if you don't want to go. So the, the one of the first things is, is it something that you want to do? Fine, do it. He's not telling you to make a long-term commitment of friendship to this person. It's a dinner, right? It's a dinner, not a bunch of dinners, not we'll do this every Thursday. It was a dinner, well, right? Well, when it's not somebody that... You have nothing in common, so it... It should fall apart anyway. Yeah. And it's, so a lot of this is self correct I'm still answering your question. Can you hold on what you got? You yeah. had another question? Um, a lot of this is self-correcting. If you are living the way you ought to live, a person who's not genuinely interested in Christ will fail to continue to be interested in you. Right? So that will begin to fizzle itself out anyway. Right? Secondarily, if you go out with someone, now there are, there are cases when someone might find you intellectually intriguing or whatever, uh, or maybe um, emotionally intriguing or whatever, maybe carry some things that are in common in the natural, but you couldn't be more different spiritually. Mm -hmm. Then there's going to be some common ground, but again, it's probably going to fall apart over time because you can't carry on real conversations that go anywhere that mean anything because what means something to you is different what's something that means something to them. So it's going to fall apart. But, you know, I've had people in my life who continue to want to maybe be around me a little bit, though they weren't born again. And eventually they did wind up falling <laughs> off. But um, they were interested in the gospel, but they're more interested intellectually than they were in their heart. But they were not, at least when I gave the gospel, they were not hostile to it. They were willing to listen. In a case like that, if, if, if you can have a... Uh, a banter back and forth with them where they're not being hostile against the gospel and they're willing to listen, then keep going. But if you can tell they've already thrown up the red flag, they're like, well, you know, I buy all that other stuff, that whole thing about Jesus being virgin born and being God, I don't buy that, you know. I, the other stuff is okay, but, you know, no, I'll never believe that. Well, then the conversation's already over. Look, where does it stand on anything? Should, should you be able to invite that person <clears throat> to your home for an occasion of birthday or whatever. Well, if they're a family member or if they're a friend of the person you're throwing a birthday party for, I don't think that there's anything that's good to say you can't invite them to a birthday party. Um, uh, in fact, birthday parties are far less formal than a dinner where it's just two couples. You know what I mean? So um, I, I wouldn't get in bondage over anything like that at all. I'm, it's a good question. I don't think that there's any reason to feel bondage over anything like that. Because God didn't tell us to get off the planet. We're mm -hmm. going to run into people. Um, but the big deal is the type of fellowship. The scripture is very clear what fellowship, what koinonia, what joint experience do we have with the world? None. So, you know, you can have a casual acquaintance in the world, someone that if you ran into them in public and you're both hungry, you might grab some lunch together, something like that. But you're not someone that you spend a, 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 an absorbent amount of time with. They're not someone that you've committed to a long-term friendship with. They're more like an acquaintance. Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But there again, time will wind up weeding that out as well. Because over time, they're going to probably just really not want to be around you anyway if you're walking the way you need to walk. So does that answer your question? Yeah, sure does. It's a very good question, though, because, you know, Christians that take this seriously run into, well, what if? You know, people that don't care never ask that question. 
know what I'm saying? It never even occurred to them to ask it. Well, I'll just invite them anyway. Well, it's, it's important to understand there are lines, and we don't want to cross them. Any, I, I give you a one good rule. Anything that you do that makes a commitment of relationship to someone who is not committed in relationship to your Lord is not good. It's not healthy. Hello? Now, again, some pressing company accepted because we already know that if you're married to a non-believer, what God says about that, that's a totally different issue, yeah. Yeah. all right? Yeah. We're talking about things you have control over and can do something about, right? But if so, if I have got to, I would not want to hang out with a person who rejects my Lord anyway. Yeah. There's nothing that I find compelling yeah. about them, yeah. right? The only reason I would want to be around them is to try to win them to him. Yeah. And if they've already made a declarative statement that I will not bow the knee to that guy, then we've already, the relationship's already it's over. Settled. It's already been dealt with. I can't really have communion with them. And and, 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 I, and there have been some relationships where I just told them that. And I didn't say, it. again, there's a right way and a wrong way to say it. Not that they're going to take it right one way or the other, but you need to be careful how you say it. I tell a non-believer, you know what? I like you, but the truth of the matter is our goals are not the same goals. Our views are not the same views. And something that I consider precious, you consider to be laughable. And uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not taking offense at that, but you just need to understand this relationship is never going to go anywhere. We're going to get in on each other's nerves, and before long, one of us is probably going to get irritated. So I'm just going to walk away from this, you know, out of, out of respect to my Lord and out of respect to a true relationship. If we really had a true relationship, um, uh, you know, I would have to be honest when I'm being honest. And so I'm walking away. If you ever, ever decide that you want to consider Jesus being your Lord, I will be there. But uh, we have really nothing to talk about. And then end it. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a good number of people in the world that actually would respect you for that. Um, they probably were wanting to have a conversation with you, and they just didn't have the nerve to. Um, or they will be offended, in which case don't worry about it, because they're going to get offended anyway. They're already offended at your Lord. They might as well be offended at his servant, right? So just don't worry about it. So, uh, um, but, it, it, you know, we don't want to deliberately offend people by the way we do things. We want to be ingratiating. We want to be kind. But you cannot lie against your Lord to do that. Amen? So uh, those are the lines right there. You don't lie against the truth. Isn't that what this That's right. That's right. So, okay, so um, we'll, we'll pick up <laughs> next week with um, some more uh, passages that deal with this last part and how to best understand it so that we're not those people. Uh, we'll probably do it more in a conversational uh, format next week, read the passage and just discuss them, because uh, we'll be having dinner together or breakfast together.